Hello, and welcome to my lecture on dementia-based technology supporting caregiver stress, as well as those with dementia. And I'm Barbara Hewlett, and I'm going to share a lecture with you based on research that I did a couple of years ago with Plane Tree, presented at the Plane Tree National Conference. But also this lecture is based on my personal experience or my personal quest of understanding dementia and how to provide care for those we love as a caregiver. So this lecture is both uh, scientific based as published in um, Medicina Journal last May uh, 2020 and my personal stories as a caregiver, caregiver for my mom who had Parkinson's, dementia from Parkinson's, my father-in-law who had Alzheimer's, my grandmother who had vascular dementia, and my late husband, Joe, who had Alzheimer's as well. So this is a story based on research, published research, and my personal quest. So first, let me give you a little bit of background on dementia, because demen dementia is not a disease in itself. It is an umbrella term that we use to describe those who are suffering from cognitive impairment based on many diseases. Um, there are over 120 different forms of dementia that we know about, or diseases of dementia. Most common that we see today is, is, is Alzheimer's, uh, vascular dementia, and Parkinson's. Um, but there's a similarity, regardless of the disease that is causing the dementia, there is a similarity in what they're experiencing. It's predominantly a disease or diseases of the aging, which is a very growing population. Today, we have very few drugs and they're really not very effective. There's no cure on the horizon and we are, have a limited source of caregivers that can take care of this population. Our housing, appropriate housing for those with dementia is, is not adequate. And today we have 5.8 million Americans living with these diseases. One in three seniors dies of dementia. But what is dementia? If it's not a particular disease, what is? It? Well, as I said, it's a, it's a cognitive impairment. The symptoms that we see in dementias are loss of the, that cognitive impairment, memory loss, communication becomes extremely difficult, not only their ability to communicate to us, but their understanding of what we're saying. So that whole communication piece is impaired. The ability to make decisions, timely decisions, any decisions are impaired. And their emotional control, we like to say the filters are impaired. Not that they don't have these emotions, but the filters for screening out appropriateness is broken. But they have needs and they have very specific needs. Those with dementia have needs of in support of their activities of daily living. As the disease progresses, very few of those with dementia can take care of themselves independently at home. They also need medical care and emotional support. And most importantly, one that we often forget is the social support. So when we, we look at those with dementia, we see two sides. We often focus only on the cognitive functions or the, the cognitive impairments, such as our memory loss, the attention span, and the lack of memory, and the spatial skills, the language skills, the clear thinking, clear judgment, and control again of those motions. Those are what we typically think of, of symptoms of dementia. 
But we also need to consider this strong emotional side that those with dementia still maintain. They still can be happy, joyful, loving. They still have desires and needs. They long for sociability. They long for meaning and value and they don't know how to get it. They long for human interaction, which is hard when the cognitive side is not working. It's hard for those with dementia to express those feelings and those needs. But often when we consider these two parts of the person with dementia, we can often reach those with dementia by going directly to the emotional side and not forcing ourselves on the cognitive side, such as asking questions when they don't understand where an emotional hug or pat on the shoulder can say a lot that words cannot. And that emotional side is very strong throughout their journey with dementia. So we'll talk more about how to tap into this resource as we go along here. As dementia is a very human condition with real people, we need real human solutions to solve and to help solve these problems. About 35 years ago, there was a, a great movement that started in San Jose, California in a hospital by a patient who felt that she was not being understood as a person and was being treated more like the replacement of a carburetor taking her car into the garage. This started a new movement that is still going strong today called the patient-centered movement. It started in a hospital, but it's trickling down into many of our healthcare environments, including senior living facilities, and even businesses that put the person first. The principles of the patient-centered movement were to de-stress the patient, so allowing them to heal better. And that meant providing comfort for the patient and their family, and to create a supportive place, an environment of care and interventions, all to improve their, their uh, medical outcomes. But some of the things it didn't address was the emotional side, the, the complexity of human relationships and social needs and creativity, even the spiritual connection and the connection to our world as a whole, to what we're calling the human-centric model of care. And this is stemming from the patient-centered movement, but it includes all people, not just the patient. And this is really important when we're considering how to support the person with dementia. So this human-centric approach is really um, geared on focusing on the basic human needs of human touch and nature and community. It has moved beyond that plain tree principles and have integrated a much greater whole in visionary care. When we talk about the person with dementia, we have to include the dementia team because we know the person with dementia can no longer function independently. They rely on others to give them the voice and to convey their needs so that we can provide better care, better outcomes for them. So we're talking about those with dementia as a caregiving team, a caregiver and the person with dementia. We always need to put these two together in the, our ability to address their needs. So who are the caregivers? We talked a little bit about who the person with dementia is, but who are the caregivers? They're predominantly volunteers. Caregivers are somebody, someone, who is responsible for taking care of another person. 
Most of us experience that ourselves. Over 80% of us at some point of our life will be a caregiver, sometimes a minor caregiver, sometimes a major caregiver that takes over our life. Some caregivers are paid caregivers, but for the purpose of this lecture, we're going to talk specifically about the volunteer caregiver, the one that provides care in their home, not in an institution. So who is this caregiver? What's, what's the data on our caregiver population? Well, they're predominantly female. More than 80% of our caregivers are, are women. And the relationship of caregivers is kind of split between the children of the person with dementia and a spouse of the person with dementia. What's really telling about the data here is the age of the caregiver. Over 80% of caregivers are over the age of 60. That's pretty scary. That means we have seniors taking care of seniors with dementia without the training, without the resources. And this caregiver pool is diminishing because our aging population is growing. We're outpacing the supply of caregivers. Family members are moving away. Families are smaller. Where are the new recruits for caregiving? And the need for training. And caregivers are overwhelmed by their responsibility and the job. Where do they find help? The responsibilities of a caregiver are really, really challenging. Not only do they have to just provide care, but what is that care? Well, they have to provide household tasks, the cleaning and the cooking and keeping the home for the person with dementia, but those kind of things can be outsourced and are not typically the burden of stress. But here's where it starts to become stressful for the caregiver, the physical care that one has to provide for the person with dementia. They have to help give a shower. They have to help using the toilet, taking care of personal hygiene needs like brushing their teeth, shaving, combing their hair. These type of things get very intimate and difficult to, for the caregiver to provide support for. And then there are all these administration tasks or secretarial tasks, such as um, filling out the forms, contacting the um, uh, insurance company, sorting out what is, um, what, uh, what bill goes to which payer, who covers what kind of information, and the mountains of forms and red tape, sorting out Medicare from Medicaid, knowing if there's resources, who's going to pay for what. This part is gets very, very um, challenging for those without any experience on this. Critical thinking and decision making that the caregiver has to take over for the individual. We, without dementia, can make those um, decisions on our own. When we don't have the ability for critical thinking or decision making, we have to rely on others to do that. That becomes really scary when we're making these kind of decisions, often life and death decisions for another person. For example, as a caregiver myself, when my late husband was faced with gallbladder surgery, he, we were in the surgical suite ready for surgery. And the um, cardiologist said, no, we can't do the surgery. And the surgeon said, well, we have to do the surgery. If we don't have the surgery, he will not live. And the cardiologist uh, uh, argued back that you went on with the surgery, he would die from a heart condition. Both physicians turned to me 
and said, what do you want us to do? That is a major decision that caregivers are forced to make in many, many times. And then there's the crisis management. Sometimes within your own families, you have siblings um, not agreeing on what should, how we should take care of mom, or we have children that are in different states and trying to understand what's going on with dad. So we have all of these family conflicts and friend conflicts can become very personal and difficult. And the caregiver is in the middle of this. The caregiver is on call day and night for the health and well-being of the person they're caring for. And then there's the worry, the emotional worry, the physical draining on the caregiver, just trying to keep all these balls in the air. And then finally, the worrying about when the end comes, how do we handle this? What do we do? So the caregiver is responsible for all of these tasks. And sometimes they're shared among family members, but it is very challenging. And that's why we see very few people just stepping up to this job. Oh, I want to be a caregiver. And yet, we take on the role of caregiving with true love for the person in need. And that's why we do it. So how can we ease that caregiver burden? How can we provide support for them? Well, their, their tasks fall into these buckets, if you will. And the, the, the first bucket is the, the, the task list that of things that we need to do, um, the using using equipment, giving a bath, um, dealing with mood swings, um, keeping up with the doctor's appointments and schedules and meds, and just generally supporting the the activities of daily living. All of those fit into one category of task, and the reason that this is important as we think of interventions, and we think of what those interventions we might be, we want to think of interventions into these kind of tasks so we can find the appropriate resources for them. The next bucket we have is the confliction of uh, demands between family, caregiver, person with dementia, and self. How does one balance these needs? And how do we provide support in these areas? Um, then we have that, the third bucket is that of those um, administrative kinds of tasks, the, the needs here, the, the insurance forms, the, the paying of bills. Um, how do we pay those bills? How much do things cost? Who's responsible? How do I submit claim forms? How do I pay these bills? Where does the money come from? And dealing with all of these financial and administrative needs. Then we have the physical, the um, emotional bucket and those particular needs. And this is primarily focused on, on the caregiver. Those, how do we deal with the caregiver burnout and stress. What about those sleepless nights? How do we handle that? And poor diet. And poor diet seems to be grabbing some junk food because I don't have time to sit down and have a meal or just there's no time to cook. Um, so all of these emotional tasks impact our physical and emotional health of our caregiver. And lastly, where do we find the resources? Where do we find information? Who can help? What are the rules? What does it mean to have Parkinson's and dementia from Parkinson's? How do we deal with these kind of tasks? And although it may not seem to be a big bucket compared to some of our others, it is one that affects all of the other buckets of tasks we have. Because if we don't know where to get the information, the emotional task of, of, of taking care of 
one or giving a person a shower, we're not able to deal with that. So we have to be able to get those resources to support all of the other burdens of stress that caregivers are carrying. 72% of all caregivers' health has worsened since becoming a caregiver. That is an important number and one that we know strongly from both this research that I've done as well as our data that we have on caregiver, uh, dementia-based caregivers. 59% of all caregivers experience depression or anxiety. That's a big number, that's more than half. 32% of all our caregivers have missed their own doctor's appointments because of caregiving. And 15% of all caregivers have been hospitalized because of their own health issues because of becoming a caregiver. And this case was demonstrated very clearly in um, my research. I myself had a heart attack in the process of caregiving. One of our other um, uh, interviewees in this research um, had a knee surgery because when he was giving his wife a bath, she fell on his knee and crushed it. Um, and so these are real issues, serious issues. And a lot of these kinds of things could have better outcomes with better training and resources and how to manage some of the issues that caregivers have. I remember caregivers jump into these, this role and responsibilities with no background and no training. There's also a cost of caregiving. 44 million Americans provide over 37 billion hours of unpaid care each year for the person with dementia. So that means that with, with uh, family members providing over 75% of that care, that we have to consider if the family was not taking care of their loved ones, who would be providing that care and who would be paying for it? So there are many things to consider in the financial aspect of caring for those with dementia in addition to the caregiver's needs. Okay, let's get to the research. I wanna explain a little bit about the research and, and what some of these charts um, mean. The research was based on uh, interview with 15 caregivers, personal interviews that we did and a questionnaire that provided the data on these. And, uh, follow-up interviews. And as you can see from this um, chart, these 15 caregivers were both male and female. Um, most of them were elderly. We have a couple of younger people. And the relationship of the caregiver with the person that had dementia. And the diagnosis. We have a number of, we have certainly Alzheimer's being a predominant diagnosis, but we also have vascular dementia trauma, brain tumor, uh, many things can, can cause dementia as well. All of these uh, volunteer caregivers were providing the care within their own home or within the home of the person with dementia. So in addition to the 15 people of uh, volunteer home-based caregivers, I also collected data on caregivers within facilities. They were predominantly facilities which I designed, so I had direct contact with these facilities. Um, there were um, nine different facilities and an average of five to seven different caregivers within each of the um, facilities. So we took the data from uh, both the volunteer home-based caregiver as well as a caregiver in facilities. And this is the data that, we, that I'm presenting today from both of these sources. For the purpose of this lecture, I'm going to be talking predominantly about the volunteer caregiver, those working 
in home with somebody they personally have a relationship with. I do will include some comparisons so we can see where the gap is between the home-based caregiver and the um, caregiver in the facility. So there is, there is a gap in that in, in some cases. So we'll talk about that as well. So that's the basis of our research where I collected this information and data. Chart is probably one of the most important. Um, and um, it does, it, it is very um, accurate to the research that we see out there as well. These are the predominant drivers of caregiver stress. This came from my collection from the, the home-based caregivers of what they were feeling was the most difficult caregiving task that they were providing for. And you can see the first three we're going to concentrate on because they're really up there, but we can't forget about some of the smaller tasks like wandering or sundowning that are also difficult tasks to deal with. But um, we look at uh, managing their medicine being a very big task for the home-based caregivers. Uh, I recall one gentleman's story who was taking care of his wife of over 50 years in his 80s, and he was talking about managing his wife's medication, that there were more, more than 33 different meds. And he was constantly worrying about giving her the medication at the right time, at the right dosage, with food or with not food, at nighttime or when she's awake or midday. It was a constant worry, source of worry for him to get that medication to her um, accurately and timely. The next major, very close to managing medicine, um, it's just a memory loss, dealing with a person with memory loss, not being able to understand you, not being able to communicate. It's like just like speaking another language. They just could not. The, the memory loss became so severe and becomes so severe as the disease progresses. Can't understand what time it is um, being. Is it time to go to bed? Is it time for lunch? Is it time for breakfast? Uh, and and not recognizing things, not recognizing sometimes her own home or the front door. Um, we had a woman that refused to go into her own house saying it wasn't her house and she had no idea whose house it was. So there are, there are the memory loss and all the confusion that goes along with that is is very, very stressful. And then hygiene, just handling the hygiene issues and accidents that happen with not being able to find the toilet in time um, and then having to clean that person, having to help give a shower and invade somebody's very personal um, part of themselves to provide that care. So those are the top three stressors that um, the caregivers that I worked with shared but um, take a look at these other stressors because they're also very difficult. Wandering can be extremely difficult and a person um, just leaving the home and looking for something and uh, can't find them for hours, maybe they're not dressed properly, um, is a great source of worry. Will they walk into the street? Will they jump on a bus? Who knows? And it's a great source of, of worry. So all of these elements contribute to caregiver stress, and it's how to manage these that becomes a challenge for all of us. This is a very important concept that the caregivers themselves came up with. It's a process, or what we would call a protocol, for getting from symptoms and the stress of symptoms to a mitigation process. So we start with the, um, the stressful symptom that the caregivers are experiencing. So let's start with one of the um, top ones, the, the, memory, the memory loss. And then there's a trigger that triggers a particular event of bad behavior 
that a caregiver may become stressed about. For example, caregiver number 12 in my study shared a story um, that she occurred with her husband um, who was having a very difficult time specifically at dinner time. And he became very disruptive while she was preparing dinner. And he would, at first he started um, emptying the trash container on the, the floor. So the next night she took the trash out of it and she tried again. And then he became very agitated and started going through the cabinets and opening the cabinets and removing the cat. The, the contents. She became very stressed and told him not to do that, shut the doors, banged him, even got irritated herself. And he continued to do this. And then she was thinking about happier times before the dementia set in and how they used to prepare dinner, where he would read his newspaper, share conversation, what was in the paper, while she would prepare dinner. So she thought about this and she said, he's missing his newspaper. So by a positive distraction, she brought the newspaper into the process of making dinner. She gave him the newspaper, suggested he sit in his favorite chair, and she was going to make dinner. She reassured him that this was a process that he was familiar with and content with. And he did not display the same disruptive behavior. He was content to read the newspaper, became somewhat talkative, but mostly just mostly looked at the newspaper and she continued to make dinner in peace. Well, what this illustrates is we have the symptom of the disruptive behavior, the stress that it causes the caregiver. And we look for what is the trigger? Why is this happening? And the, the caregiver determined that the trigger was he was looking for his newspaper. He couldn't find it. So the, the mitigation or the solution to this problem was giving him a newspaper, encouraging him to read the newspaper. And then she found the disruptive behavior was settled and he was no longer um, disagreeable and uh, disruptive during this time of dinner. So it's a process, and the caregivers came up with this process together. We look at the symptom, we look at the stress that it causes a caregiver, we see if we can identify the trigger, and we look for a mitigation process or method to solve the problem. And this, this simple three-step procedure can be used for, for many of the disruptive behaviors that our uh, ones with dementia um, um, show or illustrate. Here. Because as the person with dementia becomes increasingly frustrated, it decreases the inhibition or the filters in order to move on and um, find some relief from that so triggers of disruptive behavior are really important. Sometimes we can understand them and sometimes they remain elusive to us. Even when they're elusive and we don't identify the particular trigger that causes this disruptive behavior, we can still find support and help mitigate and provide better outcomes. But understanding the trigger is very important. They typically fall into the uh, behavioral triggers that, that trigger uh, disruptive behavior, particularly fall into three categories, the medical triggers, the behavioral triggers, and even the environment can trigger disruptive behavior. So let's look at medical triggers. This is when a person with dementia is uncomfortably physically for some reason. Um, their shoe might be hurting, their clothes might be too tight, or something may be pinching or rubbing them in their clothing or article that they're wearing. It's, um, they might have a headache and they don't know how to tell you. They might have a stomach ache or aren't feeling good and they don't know how to tell you. And the, the, the feeling, the physical feeling that can be Tra trace down to a medical issue 
is not always um, obvious. They may have an infection brewing that we're not aware of. So they in themselves can trigger a disruptive behavior because that part of the brain, that cognitive part of the brain that is able to, to communicate, I have a headache, is not there. So they, dis they just behave badly and in a number of different ways. They can be very combative. They can kick people. They can turn over furniture. Um, a number of different things that we think of as symptoms of, dis of um, dementia are actually triggered by, uh, by some medical, behavioral, or environmental issue. Behaviorally, the, the triggers are based on predominantly on communication and um, understanding. These, these themselves, because a person with dementia does not understand something or command, a caregiver may ask a question of a person with dementia that the person with dementia doesn't understand what the question is. They can ask the person, how do you feel today? And the person with dementia doesn't know how to respond to it. Or how is your daughter? And they don't know, oh, do I have a daughter? Where's my daughter? I gotta go find my daughter. Is she okay? So the, the communication and the understanding presents a very, very strong link to the disruptive behavior. And the third um, trigger is environmental triggers. These are things that are in our environment, in our places, our homes, that cause disruptive behavior. They trigger disruptive behavior. So they can be like um, a dark corner, can be very concerning for a person with dementia. Glare on the floor, trying to understand what that is. I see a face in that glare. That can cause disruptive behavior. Can't find their, their front door, can't find their bedroom, can't find their keys or looking for something that they're placed in, um, can start a whole chain reaction of disruptive behavior. Much like we saw with our caregiver number 12, who, whose husband couldn't find the newspaper when she was cooking. And that triggered a disruptive behavior of emptying the contents of cabinets. So these, these um, what we look at as symptoms or the, the disruptive behavior are caused by triggers and understanding them of the first, first approach to doing something that can solve and provide better outcomes. So this chart, again, by our, our data from our research, shows interventions for triggers. And these are interventions that predominantly the caregivers came up with. Many of them came up with these on their own. And these, uh, these interventions seem to have fallen into three categories. One, the positive distractions. Two, the human touch the hugs, the hand-holding, the comforting words. And three, interesting, is technology. Technology can offer support for these triggers that cause disruptive behavior. And that's very exciting because we can provide resources in the area of technology. For example, if you recall, one of the, the greatest stressor for caregivers was managing medication. Well, technology has contributed to solving this problem by providing the, medic, the medicine management machines or the pill dispensers, things that had been used in facilities for a long time, but these particularly geared to a person at home. That's very exciting. As we look at the interventions and what they are, for the various uh, caregiver stresses, it's a little more hopeful that we can find solutions. 
So let's look at the results of the study and see what our caregivers have told us and are telling us. First of all, what are caregivers asking for? And surprisingly, they're not asking not to do it, or I don't want to do this anymore. They're, lacking, they're looking for information, empowerment. How much does something cost? Knowledge, training, resources. They want to know how to do this. It isn't that they don't want to do it or take this task away from me. They want to know how to do it better that can provide better outcomes for their loved ones and for themselves. This chart shows the disparity of resources. Now this is one where I'm bringing in a comparison with our facility-based caregivers. And we, we see here the, um, the, the, the two charts, the, um, the, the, the aqua blue is our home base. Um, yes, our aqua blue is our home base and our olive green is our facility base. And we're looking at how they can, um, how the disparity of, of outcomes and where they get their resources. So we look at um, the, different, the different areas of resources and we see that the home-based caregiver does not know where to get the resources that the uh, facilities people do that have access through their professional connections or facilities of how to provide the resources. Like the managing medication, it's not, an, it's not a stressor for facility-based caregivers where it is the number one stressor for the home base. And you see, start to see where the, the um, home-based caregivers get their information from church groups, from their social network, um, from neighbors, from friends, from organizations they may have belonged to, from families, from sisters. Um, so, so this is where they are getting their resources. And the disparity between the home-based caregiver and the um, facility-based caregiver is really great. When we talk about dementia-based technology, what are we talking about? Again, because of the different degrees and the different categories of stress that the caregivers have, we have, we have found that technology also becomes, is grouped into providing um, resources for those particular burdens that the caregivers are providing. So we have um, dementia-based technology, and that's technology that is specific to those with dementia and the people that are caring for them. So we have robotics and we have telehealth, and we have smart technology that we're seeing in the home. We have wearable technology, we have fun and entertainment, and we have our pill minder, and finally we have our safety uh, category. How do we keep those with dementia safe in their, in their home? I'm going to share some examples of each one of these category. They're by no means complete, but it'll give you a little idea about the kinds of technology that's out there and that are available currently and what might be the next generation of technology in these different groups that can provide relief. The robotics technology is growing and the, the person, people with dementia are really um, enjoying this particular component. It's a very soothing one, not for everybody, but many people with dementia really gravitate to these little companions. They can be like this um, little robot that the woman is holding on her lap is, is um, part of a study being done in France right now um, of robotics with those with dementia. And they can be programmed specifically to an individual's own preference, preferences. So if they like to sing, the robot can help them sing or do sing-alongs or dancing. 
and they can be tuned, programmed specifically to that person. Then there's the, uh, like this little harp seal. They're little cuddle, cuddle buddies. And there are cats and dogs, and this one's a seal. They can purr. They can make little noises. They can blink their eyes. Some of them even look like they're breathing. They provide a lot of comfort um, for a person with dementia, especially if they're you know, feeling socially isolated. This can bring a lot of comfort. So what's new in robotics and what can this do? And we can look at robotics um, both in engineering feats and medical procedures, but we also need to look at it as a human-centric um, capability of providing comfort to those with dementia. Uh, telehealth is is a wonderful uh, breakthrough in in dealing with the medical needs of those with dementia, um, and and this is exciting. It it's been uh, it had a lot of new development since um, the pandemic, where it was harder to get people to. Uh, medical facilities and not wanting to bring seniors, the most vulnerable, into medical facilities. A lot could be done um, with telehealth. This has also saved stress on the caregiver for not having to get the person to the doctor's office and get them in the car, which often took another person to be able to do this. But some of the new things that are coming up in telehealth, it, specifically for dementia, is this, like this example in the center here, which is now programming, using, and focusing on that emotional side of the dementia a person with dementia. So using pictures and sounds and graphics to help communicate with the person with dementia instead of words that the person with dementia has a hard time understanding the meaning for. So um, there's very exciting developments in the area of, of telehealth. Smart home technology that was really geared for the home consumer has really made its way into the homes for those with dementia and some exciting new things that can happen. And an old technology that is still extremely useful and popular is the picture phones. Um, for example, you can see the pictures of family members or a doctor or neighbor who, who one needs to call and just pressing the button on the picture rather than remembering a phone number or even reading a phone number or a name. This provides a direct link to that person. I know my own mother um, found this one of the most helpful interventions we had in help keeping socially connected. Many times a person with dementia may be thinking of a person and wanting to talk to them, but not knowing how to do that, not remembering a phone number or even that they could reach them by phone, but having a little reminder with the pictures and the faces, just pushing that button, connect them with their daughter or their son or their grandchild or a neighbor. So these are wonderful smart home technology. And we can't forget about where Alexa is going with being able to lock doors and turn off lights and turn on lights. Um, it's a wonderful technology that, as, especially for the early phases of dementia, very, very appropriate and exciting. Wearable technology is also um, increasing and um, the GPS and the shoes to track the person with dementia. It's been around for a few years, but it's it's it relieves a lot of stress for the caregiver. If a person does get out of the house and starts wandering and not knowing where they are, you can track the person on your computer or cell phone using the same technology as find my phone. Uh, but find my spouse who is wandering on the streets. They don't have to, they can get to that person much quicker without involving the police and the neighborhood recruit staff to go and help find the person with dementia. This is also available in patches that one can wear. And wearable technology can be in all kinds of things that the person wears and is totally non invasive. Person with Dementia doesn't even know that they are wearing such devices. 
entertainment is a very, very, very happy part of technology that can provide a great deal of, um, of de-stressing the caregiver and the um, and the person with dementia. There's nothing more valuable than the smile that a caregiver gets from the person with dementia because they are enjoying life, which this type of technology can help. Um, there's a, you can get people back on their feet and dance and bowling and even driving race cars can be exciting. The, the virtual reality can take people to places that they never got to or places that they did and they want to re-enjoy. And even the simple radio, um, if it is a radio that they can use and with simple buttons and technology, not like our digital music makers today, but going back and finding something that is simply an on-off button and plays music can be very, very delightful and comforting for those with dementia. Even in the late phases of dementia, when a person is totally bedridden or uncommunicative, technology can help with headphones, playing music or voices or conversation with loved ones, bring smiles to the person listening to them, their eyes brighten and that they listen. So technology for all levels of, of uh, dementia is very helpful. And the medical dispensing machine that we talked about is very helpful. That um, And in the case of my mom, it saved her almost a year of independence at home just because she was able to take her medicine on a timely manner. And then technology for safety is extremely important. Things that were in the, the facility home, like um, the... Uh, Awareness of one gets out of bed um, goes to the nurse's station, and we know that room 23, the person has gotten out of bed and can get to that person safely. Um, wearable technology that can uh, alert with falls and the sensors for kitchen appliances of some of the safety features, even the monitoring systems that facilities have in all, the, in all their nurses' station can now be at home and we can monitor the activities of the person with dementia in privacy. So the dimension-based technology interventions, this is a list contributed by our caregivers of what type of interventions they were looking at to understand and to help support um, the the musical inter intervention, music and memory is very strongly linked and can help both in communication as well as provide extended pleasure for those. And this chart shows the users, the caregivers, um, lack of familiarity with this equipment, which means that they aren't getting the information they are, it isn't being, it isn't being transferred from what's happening in facilities to that same need as what's happening at home and getting those tools for those caregivers at home to take care of and deal with some of the very same problems that those in facilities are doing. And finally, I, I want to talk a little bit about the phases of dementia because this is important because if we're going to provide technology um, for those with dementia, the person with dementia isn't always the same. They go through phases of dementia. We have three major phases with some subphases in between them. But the person in early phase dementia who still may be living at home, still may be driving, needs prompts, sometimes message boards and prompts and things that help them remember things that they forget. Um, so resources there um, in the early stages of dementia are very different from where they are 
in our late phases of dementia where they are pretty much um, immobile and non-communicative. And that technology may be related to only things that can provide comfort and keep them safe. So the middle phase of dementia is where the person with dementia is still very active and moving around and talkative. Um, they have some of the strongest needs. They also have some of the strongest um, disruptive behavior that is so stressful for those caregivers. This is the area we really need to work on um, to help those caregivers deal with some of these disruptive behaviors. Finally, we look at what's the next generation of dementia-based technology. Here we want to get creative, think out of the box, but we want to go back to those same areas that are causing stress for those caregivers where we don't have good solutions and how to handle them. We want to look at, you know, the, continue to look at research for what's going on with dementia. How can we prevent it? How can we delay it? If it is, we want to look at a technology in the area of, of um, lifestyle and activities and um, so, so our next generation of technology, we want to think outside the box and how to deal with the problems and go back to those burden of stress that our, our caregivers have shared with us and provide some answers for them. So we've come to the end of our journey for today and the conclusion of my lecture today. I'd like to summarize some of the things, the important things that we've heard and learned from our caregivers that are taking care of their loved ones inside their home or the home of their, their loved ones. We must continue to think of how dementia is going to impact in the future with the growing number of the aging population and the growing number of the diseases of dementia. And as we think about them, we want to look at continued research, innovating research that helps with all of the stressors that the caregivers have defined so carefully to us. We want to continue to listen to those caregivers because they know firsthand what they're dealing with and the stresses. They have come up with innovations on their own. We need to look at how we can take those innovations and translate them into new technologies that can be shared. We need to look at how we can take lessons learned from what are happening in facilities and bring them into the home so the caregivers at home can have access to the same innovation and technology. And we must know that as we move into the inventionness of new technology, that we do it with human-centered attention, care for people, making it simple for caregivers to know how to do it, making it simple and easy to use for seniors that may not have experience with technology. We need to know who's going to be using it and how. We need to know what symptoms they're trying to relieve. So technology can bridge the gap until we find a cure for these dreaded diseases. But we know as we continue to bring technology, we're trying to bring technology to really improve the quality of life. And not only for the patient or the person that has dementia, but for all of those that are caring for dementia then the benefit will be great for all of us. We will all benefit when we can call ourselves a dementia-friendly community. Thank you, and have a great day. Bye-bye.